At its core, people are good. And that inspires me. Like that is what keeps me going because that's my spirit. People give me that and I go, ah, yes, this feels good. <laughs>So when do you go home? How long are you here for? I go home at uh, eight o'clock tomorrow night. Tomorrow, all right. Yeah, you like you having a good time? Yeah, yeah, it's a blast. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I just run around, do whatever I want, and see all the cool stuff, and that's that's kind of nice. Usually, I'm working, so do yeah, it work? it is weird. I I notice like you can get used to. This is a very first world problem. It actually sounds a little egotistical, which is where I want to start. But you get used to being like special because oh, like yeah. you're like you're always invited. You're always talking, uh, you know, maybe you're representing a company and then you're just like, this is how it's supposed to be. And then you go and you're just like a regular person and you're like, oh yeah, this is how life actually is. Just, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody you're cares. just one of a billion. And, <laughs> Your and name's like, not you on some that. special list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's not like, like, <laughs> there's not like a book that has yes. your bio in it and your oh photo. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm enjoying it though. Because one of the things I used to do back in the early fighting days when I, when I, when a sport was just starting and I was unsure when I yeah. was like, this seems a little sketchy. Um, I used to go to fights and I would sit yeah. in the audience. Like, like a regular you know, fan. Like a regular person, yeah. like, you know, second level, you know, mm -hmm. way in the back. And I'd sit next to, you know, some old grandma and I would communicate with her and I would have the experience she was having. And yes. when, when I did that enough times, I went, this sport is going to be very successful. Right. And yeah, you're like, I think we're on a list. Yeah. You know, like the like you just get used to like like you show up at a thing and you're like yeah. the line is not yeah. for me. No, I don't do and, and you really that could I think that's not totally what drives, you know, famous or powerful people nuts, but it it, it is disorienting. It, it's it, confusing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, confusing. It, it's not good for the soul to get special <laughs> treatment everywhere you go. <laughs> well, I don't mind it. Well, of course and, you don't mind it. <laughs> and because I, I came from a world where I never had any special. Yeah. I'm about, you know, I came from a, a place of waiting in lines. So, uh, yeah, I don't mind it. And I do the trade-offs for yeah. it. But I, I, and I expect it, I should say, not to be... Well, the Stoics, unpleasant, but I don't go. The reason I haven't come to South by Southwest is <laughs> like, what? There's no, I'm, there's not a special place for me to relax. Like, I th that sounds tiring and not, yeah, fun. Well, the Stoics call, say there's, they're like, there's such a thing as a preferred indifferent. Mm. So like that we should be indifferent to like, like I train whether it's hot or cold, right? I train <laughs> whether I'm get credit for it or not credit for it. I do the work, you know. Either way. Um, but it's certainly better to get the special treatment than the regular treatment, right? And this, you know, yeah. and so, and so it, you want to get to a place where it's like, it's nice to have. If you can afford it, why would you, I don't think there's anything morally upstanding about flying coach if you have the $200 for the upgrade, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But you shouldn't be, you shouldn't get so used to it that you, it's a last minute thing. First class is full, and you're like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> yeah, well, you know, like, yeah. like, or you're just miserable as <laughs> you got to fly. Like, like I like that I'm in a place where this is very uh, bougie slash regular, but it's like, like if Southwest gets home faster than first class on another airline, I'm not like, "Well, I gotta have special treat." You know, yeah. like you're you just you take it. You want to be able. You want to. I think that's the. It's nice to have the perks but you can't be dependent on the perks or entitled nah, to the perks. You shouldn't be, or you become an asshole. Yes. <laughs> That's just how it works. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think that must be, have been interesting for you as I was thinking about, like, obviously, ego and hubris is the oldest story in the history of fighting, right? The, the hungry underdog beats the overconfident champion, right? And so you got to stay hungry. You got to stay... Uh, aware, you know, um, but how do you, you got to stay humble, but how do you stay humble when you're 16 and 0? How do you stay humble when you're when literally you're the greatest ranked fighter number on one the in the planet? Row. Yeah, in it is world. challenging. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very challenging. Um, I was very lucky that I got exposed to the martial arts culture. Mm. When I came into fighting, there wasn't a martial arts culture. It was a fighting culture. Like a boxing culture? Like boxing. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like boxing, less, more street fighting. And just, mm. there just wasn't a fabric of culture yeah so 
when I started trying to make money in the sport, because there was no money, I started teaching martial arts and interacting with all the martial artists, and I found their culture. Yeah. And that had this fabric of honor, respect, discipline, humility, like yeah. service, teaching, and it had all the principles that I live by now. The, you know, my warrior's code is from all of those principles. So I yeah. took those principles into fighting, and that's what really contributed to my success, my ability to control my ego, <laughs> because, I mean... Yeah, my first TV show, I fought Chuck Norris on CBS primetime. Yeah. You know, and was like hanging out with Chuck yeah. because I was the greatest, you know, fighter on the planet. But, you know, through, for me, it was keeping in touch with martial arts, continuing to teach, continuing to serve. I mean, I can't tell you how many battered women's police training like programs I've written with the knowledge that I have because yeah. it was the right thing to do. Um, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I can tell you where it got me yeah. when I fought uh, Kung Lee because I knew Kung Lee for years and years and we trained together and I knew all of his skill set. Yeah. And I was also the spokesman for Strike Force, which we had a deal with CBS. So like everything was going, you know, sure. we were driving it in the right situation. Um, I knew I could beat Kung, hands down, without thought, question. like, And so I went, you know what, what's more important to me? Uh, an amazing show that moves my league onto network television and sure. beating my competitor and doing this great story um, or dealing with the mechanics of the fight. Yeah. And so I chose the, <laughs> I chose plan A, yeah. which was to throw this amazing. And even in that, even as it started, like I didn't believe it would happen. My coach told me, Maury Smith told yeah. me, he goes, you block your, he goes, you can't block like that. I go, what are you talking about? Yeah. He goes, someone's going to break your arm. And this was what I said. This is my moment of hubris. I'll share it with the world. Yeah. I said, nobody's going to break my fucking arm. Yeah. And he just went, okay. And we yeah. went right back to training. <laughs> In the fight, I, boop, he breaks my arm. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I just went, huh, that was really bad. I was reading, <laughs> I was reading about, mistake. I was reading about Floyd Patterson and he was saying when he, when he fought Ingmar for the first time, he was like, I got in the ring and I wasn't afraid. Mm, and yeah. he's like that I lost. He's like you have to be afraid. Yeah. Because and he the, had deep fears. Like yes. he was I mean costumes like he had all kinds of stuff. He, you know. Yeah, but but just the, the the fear was the sign that you were on edge, that you were taking it yeah. seriously, that you knew it was a life or death thing, that it could go either way. And if you're too comfortable, that's probably not confidence, that's probably ego. Yeah. Definitely. I was always afraid in my fights. I yeah. was terrified. Yeah. Because it's violent and dangerous, and I'm trying to kill people. I'm not sure what everyone else is doing. <laughs> I'm literally trying to take people's lives with my hands. Is there a difference between confidence and ego? Yeah, totally. What's the difference? <sighs> ego It's not real. It's all fake. It's all, yeah. it's all BS. It's literally just BS. It's someone, it's, you, you've made it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of other reinforcements. It's sure. not actually real. Right. Confidence is real. Confidence is earned. Confidence is earned. Confidence is work. Confidence is, I am confident yeah. that I could teach you martial arts and you would be the greatest martial artist your body can handle because I know you've for a it. fact what I know. And that's confidence. I talk about martial arts. I, they're all facts. Ego is not a fact. It's <laughs> it's just thoughts and ideas. Right. It's like if you've done something many, many times, you're you're not confident how exactly it will go or how long it will take, but you have confidence that you can do it again. Absolutely. Yeah. That's real. Yeah. It's science. <laughs> the yeah. rest of it is is, you know, <laughs> if someone tells me I'm handsome every day for 10 years, I'm gonna believe I'm handsome. <laughs> And then I look in the mirror and I go, oh man, I'm not handsome. <laughs> but it was input. My brain believed it. It is true. But yeah, I, that's why fighting to me is the greatest human experiment because sure. it is the truth. You there's get, not a lot, there's not much room for lying. You get right to the truth yeah. and you bear your soul and you, you know, literally, you know, gut it out with another human being. And at yeah. the end of that, both people have changed because you both face these fears that are extraordinary. You both committed to trying to kill each other yeah and then now we're here yeah i think uh i i was thinking about this once i was saying like i don't believe in myself i have evidence yeah right because like ego is the of course i can do it i'm amazing look at me and 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 
the I've done hardship before. I don't quit. Like I ask questions. I learn. You know, you want you want that. Yeah, that's that's real. Yeah, that's that's real. And that was my uh, my biggest challenge in in going through this sport because when I started, nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew the technique. Right. Like people just didn't know. Sure, like, we didn't sure. have the knowledge. And sure. I'm you know a nerd, so I'm running around. Asking for the knowledge and getting my ass kicked because you don't ask in that culture. <laughs> you don't ask questions. You do what you're told. <laughs> so, right. I'm getting beat up going, I don't understand. Why does this keep happening? To Hold on. I got one more question. Um, but it was through that process where I right. went, I, I began to realize these people, they're not being, they don't know. Right. And someone's got to go find it. And data is data. And one plus one is two. Let's line them up and see what the results are. And, well, and then, right. Yeah. Ego is like, I know everything. Yeah. confidence is like i feel good enough to ask yeah right like actually you know when they go there's no dumb questions yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> that you actually do need the confidence to you be do like need a little, guys yeah. i gotta be honest i have no yeah. idea what the fuck and mine came, mine came from fear yeah i was so afraid that i was going to get hurt or beat up yeah that i just kept asking questions because it seemed logical <laughs> like and then everyone get mad, high, oh, get mad at me and yeah, yeah. Beat. i'd be like ow ow and I'd be like, okay but I'm just i got one more question buddy because <laughs> It was can, we go over, can we go over the safety procedures for the parachute <laughs> one more time? One more time, please. Oh, my God. It's so funny. Yeah, they. when I started, like, I didn't even know the rules. I'd never seen it. I was sure. in prison. I didn't know what was going yeah. on. So I didn't even know you could tap. Like, I didn't know anything. Yeah. I had no understanding. And as I got the knowledge, it just didn't make sense. You know, no one really knew. Sure. And that journey in and of itself was so hard for me to, because people had their egos. Oh, sure. I'm the master. Well, of course I know. Wait, let me show you my way. I'm like, okay, well. What about biomechanics? What about this? What about this need I have? These guys are trying to hurt me. Right. So it was a really interesting human experience to go through that. Ego, major blocker sure. for me getting knowledge until I just got so dang good that everyone was like, we better tell him because he's, gonna, he's not stomping. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a line from Epictetus, one of the Stoics. He says, um, remember, it's impossible to learn that which you think you already know. Yeah. And if you think you know everything, you're kind of right. You know, like you're a master because you cannot learn anything else. It's like, you know, the Zen story about the two cups. Yeah. They sit down to tea and uh, he pours it and pours and, and it starts to overfill. And he says, yes, this is what happens when the cup is full. But if you go in as the empty vessel, you're open, you're vulnerable, you're willing to ask you, you are aware of what you don't know. It's a lot more room. Yeah. And it's super powerful. Yes. I, the, the, what I realized going back is. I was just on this honest journey mm -hmm. and I had these principles that we all live by. So it was accepted. Everyone, everyone was into it. Yeah. And then once, like I said, once they got over the, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> cause they'd show me, I'd do it. I'd have more questions. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd get to the mechanics, the science and the, um, and, and it would start to fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'd ask more questions and I could see the change and they would struggle with this. I'm the master. I know, you know, but, these questions are unanswerable. And so I would be a kind human and go, well, maybe this. And what about over here? And Well, that's uh, how it goes, though. There's a physicist. His name was John Wheeler. He was the guy that invented the hydrogen bomb. And he, he had this brilliant metaphor. He says, as the island of knowledge grows, so does the shoreline of ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> so as you learn, right? So it's like, if I say, here's yeah. how you do this move. Yeah. You're like, okay, I got it. And then you try to do the move. You're learning all the things that weren't in, you're learning all the things that I didn't tell you yet. The nuances, well, actually you can go this way or this way. Like, so as you do it and as you put it into practice and you, you actually interact or engage with the material or you advance in your career, or your chosen line, you realize there's all this other stuff. And that's why questions beget more questions, which beget more questions. Yeah. <laughs> so weirdly, you should be asking more questions more, the more you know. You should, endless questions. Yeah, I mean, I just go around this in truth. This is what I do because yeah. I, you know, leadership coaching, I do privately in corporate. Um, I just show up and ask people questions. Yeah. I don't do anything else. I have no skills. And you're I, the expert. And I literally, and <laughs> I just you're the go, one asking the questions. Hey, yeah. Well, what's going on with this? And after, you know, 30, 40 minutes of asking questions, I know exactly what's going on with the culture, the structure, the mechanics, who's unhappy, you know, and I'm like, all right. Um, and it's just fascinating to me because it's same. It's the same in every industry. Like it just, right. I just, I go from industry to industry, and it's the exact same process. It's the exact usually same, the same problems, the same problems. And all it's, and it's it's been fascinating to me. Um, and previous to the last few years, I did it just privately. Yeah, my friends, my world, yeah. you know, my people I love. You know, I gave them this, this knowledge, and I really, you know, saw the 
impact and the results in their lives. Yeah. Um, and now that I'm kind of bringing it out in the public, I just see the problems are bigger. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. But you know what's funny about that is the, <laughs> there's nothing you're bringing from the outside that the CEO or the management team or the board, they couldn't have asked. Right. It's that they thought they already knew. Yeah. So no and, one made a change. Yeah. And so and they, they didn't ask. Happy. Yes, yeah. Exactly. It's ridiculous. It's like that Toyota thing where it's like nine whys or eight whys. If you ask why enough times, mm. eventually you get to some core fundamental issue that is the root of all the the other things. But yeah. it's when you when you take things for granted, when you make assumptions, when you think that you know, everything stays static. Yeah. Yeah. My biggest lesson, because I turned 50 yeah. in December. Uh, so technically my life is half over and I'm in the, you know, it's sec, lucky. I'm in the third phase. Um, and yeah, why was I telling you this? Damn it. Um, it's 50. Ah. Oh, I learned that I didn't really listen to people. Mm. I listened, but I was listening with another ear. Yeah. I was listening with <clears throat> my own mind. And it took me 50 years to really get through that. Yeah. <laughs> so 50, all of a sudden, I realized if I just listen to people and let them talk yeah. long enough, they will tell me the truth about themselves. And that has been the most powerful lesson in my first 50 years. So I literally just travel around. Like, How are you doing? What's going on over here? Like, eh. What's and, that guy do? And yeah, <laughs> and, then, and 30 minutes later, I'll know everything and their hopes, their dreams, their desires, what they do, what, what their thing is, what makes them unhappy. Um, and it's fascinating to me. Yeah. Because I just wander around like, hey, what's going on with you? And they look at me and they're like, this guy looks weird and he seems nice and I think I'll have a conversation with him. Um, and I do it in business. When I yeah. do leadership stuff, I wander in just like this and I just ask a bunch of silly questions. Right. But they're designed to get people to talk. Right. Because people want to talk. People want to share. People want to communicate, communicate well. And if you let them talk in a safe, comfortable area, they will literally tell you the truth about themselves. Yeah, it's like, um, I heard that noise again, BZ, by the way. Um, it's it might a, be my watch. Is it, your, is it your watch? Yeah. I just want to make sure turn, no, no, no. that the it camera's might, not turning yeah, itself yeah. off. I don't care about the noise. No, no, no. It might be me. The, wor the worst thing is you're like, wait, oh, shit. I know all about recording? the noise, bro. Don't. Okay, good. Yeah, here, this is a new camera, so that's the only yeah. thing. Yeah. No, no. I got you, man. Don't worry about it. It's, um, I, I find this like when, it, when I ask for directions, I'm like, hey, how do we mm. get to this place, right? Because you're so used to doing it on your phone. Yeah. And then someone's like, okay, so you go up here, you go to the end of the hallway, then you take a right, and then once you get... And I'm like, yeah, I definitely stop listening like halfway through. <laughs> yeah. And I, I almost assuredly do that in other parts yeah. of my life. I'm telling myself I'm asking questions, telling myself I'm listening, but I'm only listening for what I want to hear <laughs> or I'm cutting myself short because it's like, I'm only, I'm only going to get half of this. Yeah. And, and what, what you hear when you really listen is something very different than when you're half listening. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really powerful. And I didn't know I was half listening. Yeah. I had so much going on and I had so sure. much, you know, stuff in my life. Uh, and, and until I took care of those things and kind of got, you know, in another phase, got, yeah. got out of fighting, that's when I was really able to hear people. Like, listen. Yeah. And I had time for it. I had comfort for it. I had empathy for it. Um, and it's just fascinating. Like, it's just, I mean, I just wander around. That's the best. That's the best. That's what <laughs> like a philosopher the, does. Like That's what Socrates crazy did all day. Wandering dude. Yeah. yeah. And then, but what what ends up happening is, you know, I meet, uh, I met a woman on a plane, Amanda Blackwood, t t t ten years ago, and same thing. I see her, and she has this amazing energy. And I sit there with this conversation, and she tells me her story. Yeah. And I go, man, it's super powerful. I go, what are you doing on this plane? She goes, yeah. I'm a, I'm a stewardess. And I go. No, you should be out telling your story. He's like, yeah. that story would help so many people. I go, let me tell you mine. I told her my story. We're crying on a plane. We both get off. We go our separate ways. I don't hear from her for 12 years, 10 years. She sends me an email last week. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm reaching out like you told me. <laughs> Since then, I've written 12 books and this and that. Wow. And da -da -da -da, I'm this and that. And I want to speak. All the stuff you told yeah. me. I want to do the rest of it. And it's only because I sat next to her. And listen to her. She told me her yeah. truth. I told her mine. We had this moment. And then, you know, 10 years later on her journey, she's like, oh, that's right. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> she called me up. So we got her on a stage. Wow. She's speaking for our speaking group now. That's and amazing. it's so powerful. She was trafficked. She was a human trafficked for years. Like just had the most horrible human experience. Yeah. And came out just traumatized. And it took her years and years and years to heal. And through her art, through her writing, through her sharing, her speaking, she's healing. 
And so, yeah, I told her this 10 years ago. I go, oh, my God, this is what, this is what I did. <laughs> this is what worked for me. And she kept going on that journey. With, I've never heard from her until just last week. That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm thinking about martial arts culture because what's interesting about it is, again, you would think like a culture with, first off, violence, a culture with, <laughs> with a <laughs> strict hierarchy, you know, that it wouldn't be, that, that obviously egos could be uh, rife, also that it could not be super, uh, you know, welcoming or kind. What I've been fascinated with in that culture is like, you walk into a, a jujitsu gym or a martial arts gym, it's like the better the person is, the nicer they are, yes. the more open they are, mm -hmm. the more curious they are. Mm -hmm. And those aren't the people to worry about. The mm -hmm. people to worry about are the, the people who are like <laughs> six weeks ahead yeah. of you in the journey. Yeah, it's the new guy. They tear yeah. your knee out. <laughs> yes, yes. But the black belt will, no one will be gentler and nicer and more patient with you. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the cloth. That's yeah. the value. That's what I found. Mm -hmm. And where I came from was street fighting, you know, crime. I was yeah. like, oh man, this is horrible. Right. Prison. Come over here, prison. Yeah. And there's just lovely people, you know, with the same mission with an entirely different and better yeah. culture. And it changed my life. Like it, I, it's why I always, you know, when I speak in institutions and when I coach people, first thing I do is are we, are we doing martial arts. Yeah. Because it literally changed me as a human being. And then it gave me this global community. Sure. I asked them all questions and they, yeah. you know, we, we figured it out together. Well, I can fly to Denmark tomorrow and the people are still there training yeah. and thinking, talking, and we still have that relationship. And it's like that everywhere. And those people, those communities, they all taught me what a good human is. Yeah, there's almost, act. there's almost something similar to like the 12 step community in martial yeah, arts where it's totally. like, you could walk into any meeting, yep. any gym, any uh, ring, anywhere in the world, language barrier, you know, season, whatever, and like plug into it pretty quickly because mm -hmm. they're all kind of cycling through the same mm -hmm. thing. It's different people in different stages of the journey, but it just, it's this kind of decentralized thing all operating on the same operating system, mm -hmm. the same culture that you were talking about. And there's something really magical about that. There is, and it's, this is what I discovered on that journey. There is shared knowledge. Yes. There's human shared knowledge that exists in this world. And I know this because I've traveled to countries where they don't speak my language. <laughs> we cannot communicate in any way whatsoever. Yeah. They're studying the same mechanics, the same structure. They got the same ideas. They're doing the same thing with just yeah. a different approach and a yeah. different mindset, a different, you know, sporting understanding. And fascinating to me, like just fascinating. My, my uh, oldest just started jujitsu not far from here. Mm. And um, he, he kind of like didn't really, soccer didn't really work. Um, baseball didn't really work. And then he just like locked in to this. And I think it was, well, I, I discovered two things. One, like he does better if I'm outside mm -hmm. than if I'm oh, yeah. sit, like oh, the parents are sitting there. Yeah. I found if I'm outside, he can't like look, yeah. look to me. Yeah. And he has, he has to plug into the system. Yeah. He has to look up to the person who's in charge. Yeah. But that like, even though he knows just like, I think for soccer and baseball, he didn't really understand what was happening. Yeah. I think he's just as clueless with this, yeah. but there, it's almost like a, a, like a dog in a pack thing yeah. where you're just like, seems like everyone knows what they're doing. I'll just go with this flow. And there's yeah. something very primal and human about that. Yeah. Yeah. And you're moving your body and you're connecting, you're learning, you're flowing and you're in this group uh, and the group grows. And you understand some of the people in the group know more than you and you gravitate towards those people and you know, if I just, like, they're not special, more special or better or natural than me, but they just have more time. And if yeah. I just put in the time, I, it's, you know what it is? It's a very vivid reminder of the process that different people are in different parts of the process, but the process is independent and timeless and accessible to everyone. And I was, I am where they once were. And if I just show up however many times a week, I will eventually get somewhere close to where they are. Yeah. And that's right. a lot. That's a fucking life lesson. That's right. right. There. <laughs> just, just doing it. And yeah. if you just show up, like I tell, we have a lot of kids in our incarcerated youth programs. So yeah. I go in institutions, I bring them out. They get themselves out rather yeah. and they get their shit together. And then I, we pay for their martial arts education. Mm. Um, but, and then we guide them in business and, you know, we try yeah. to, we try to do for them what someone did for me. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's just, yeah, to see the change in them. Because I remember being a convict. I remember yeah. how scared and, 
alienating and odd it is and the culture in there, which is just really terrible. Yeah. And I remember trying to get into society and going, wow, I, I didn't fit before. Now I'm like, I'm so not fitting. Sure, I'm sure. just jacked up. But it, being in that culture, yeah. just having people, just showing up. Yeah. You know, having and just watching someone teach and then go, oh, that's right. You help other people. Oh, yeah. He's older, so they're helping him. I'm like, oh, this is how you... This is how you do it. And so this culture goes in every one of my businesses. Yeah. Every business I touch, if Google hires me, they're getting martial arts culture sure. and leadership because that's yeah. how it works. That's what's best for everybody, in my opinion. And then, you know, besides all the community stuff, at the end of the day, you are learning a valuable skill to protect yourself. Sure. Where else can you do that? Yeah. Where else can you get all that in one sure. spot? It's crazy. Sure. Like, it's so good. Yeah. Well, so tell me about that because that's my that was one of my introductions to your work and your way of thinking, which was your plus minus equal. Yeah, what and is, it came from the that? martial arts class. Okay, just so you know, yeah. watching, sitting back and going, we're creating a, a system here. Yeah, he's helping him, ba, 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 and we're all growing this. So that's where the original idea popped into my head. So, what does plus minus equal mean? Plus my sequel is my module for accomplishing anything. Okay. So for me, I apply it to anything I want to accomplish. I want to make a movie. <laughs> I find my plus. So I go find someone who's accomplished it, who has the- Someone better than you. Someone better than me. Someone a plus. I like to yeah. shoot high. So yeah. I go for- you know, Someone great. <laughs> someone great. The best. Yeah. It, it, even if it's yeah. two steps above you, sure. still, sure. it's where you want to go. Okay. So for me, I go, I find my plus. I Your try mentor. to find the biggest possible. Yeah. My mentor, my knowledge. I know they have done it and they'll make it easier for me to do it. And I just need to present myself <laughs> and get my mentor or my plus to accept me. Sure. And that comes with humility, <laughs> effort, socialization, communication, and being of value. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. Of course, they yes. all do. Yes. And then, so your mentor plus, arguably the most important in the beginning. Yeah. Your equal is your competitor, your person who you work with, you, has your business cross town, whoever's doing what you're doing. You need to know what they're doing. This is your sparring partner. This is your or competitor. Or the gym next door. Or, sure. the, yeah, the, the guy you're going to fight in three weeks. What's he doing? Uh, if he's your equal and you're all sharing the same knowledge and working in the same system, you need to know what those guys are doing. Your class of comedians, yeah, your class of whatever. Yeah. The people, and, yeah. And when I first came up, I didn't know about that. Yeah. I was adversarial to everybody because I'm right. a fighter. They're trying yeah. to kill me. I'm sure. all stressed out. Sure. Um, I learned to be <laughs> to get with my equals and yeah. to figure out our common ground and to communicate so they give me knowledge. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to ask a question. They'll yeah. give it to me because I'm not hating on them. Yeah, yeah. And so plus, equal, and then the minus to me is the most important as this machine grows because the minus is the person you give that knowledge to. Paying it forward. Paying it forward. So uh, let's see, I made a movie. I found a great movie director and he took me under his wing. Yeah. And then I found out what all my movies are doing in that yeah. space and how yeah. to sell it, what's going on. I talked to a bunch of guys. And then I found a young movie producer who really wanted to do what I was doing, who believed in the dream. Sure. And he did most of the work while we built this thing out. At the end, we accomplished it because I had my plus equal and the minus. And the symmetry is your plus, to, to your plus, you are the minus. Yes. And someone's a plus to him. Yes. And someone's a plus to him. Yeah. And someone's a plus to him. Yeah. It just keeps going because yes. you know we age, and yeah. as we age, you know the second half of your life, it's not about you know learning, earning. <laughs> I'm in that giving phase, yeah. and so for me, it's like how much can I give of this knowledge now, knowing soon, you know, I won't be able to give. Like my machine's going to expire. Sure. You know, my brain's going to slowly, you know, soften, and I won't have the same value to everybody. So this is my giving. And right now I want to, I really want to define this stuff to help as many people as possible. Sure. Because I've seen the results like firsthand. I did, yeah. oh, all these are experiments on me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the irony too, is that it's not totally selfless, the giving, because mm. at, at Seneca says, um, yeah. we learn as we teach. Mm -hmm. And so you're actually, this is the same, same with the, the, the peers, your equals, in articulating what you have learned, summarizing what you have learned, uh, passing, it, passing it along, seeing the mistakes that someone else is making, you're actually also seeing yourself, codifying the knowledge, clarifying the knowledge, reminding yourself of the knowledge, and it works as a, as a real sort of virtuous cycle. I feel, I yeah, feel. and it just keeps growing. Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm a bunch of pluses to a bunch of people. I'm a bunch of equals, I'm a bunch of minuses. So it just, for me, it's like anytime someone comes and I don't understand it, but they want to go somewhere. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, it's pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> let's find out who did it, who's doing it, and who wants to be doing it. And let's get those people together and, and get this thing moving. What and, I think always, uh, always looking at it as though there is a plus above you is a way of keeping ego at bay. Because you're al- there's always someone or something to be a student of. Yes. Yeah. Has to be. Otherwise, if you know it all, then you're... God, omnipresent, uh, yeah, universal yeah. energy. <laughs> certainly, uh, certainly at the end of the road. Yeah. Right? You know, like there's nothing else there's for There's nothing you. else to do. You just evaporate. You yeah. Go, <laughs> it's just... only, only place to go is down. <laughs> you just turn into mystical uh, air energy and you dis- dissipate into the molecules. So what are the virtues in your view of the, the warrior code? Like what are, what are the tenets of that warrior code? It's the same as martial arts. So honor, respect, and discipline. Yeah. And then... You know, we go a little further <laughs> because it, it's a human experience. So, um, caring for this machine sure. is of the utmost importance. Mm-hmm. Most of our illnesses are man caused. We're killing ourselves for no apparent reason. <laughs> right, right, right. Why aren't we caring for our machine? So, one sure. of our core ethos is we care for the machine properly. Mm-hmm. Our mind is the the computer. It's a it's a, it's a temple. Sure, it should be protected. It should be cared for. It needs its own care. We. Mm-hmm. That's part of our ethos, care for the mind. Yep. You can't think big. You can't guide big. You can't dream big. You can't do big things when your mind's scrambled mm-hmm. and when your mind's unfocused. We have a bunch of tools for mind development. And then it's spirit. It's getting, doing the human deed that's good. Yes. And for the most amount of people possible. Seems so, like the, do you know the four virtues of stoicism? The four uh, virtues, not, the cardinal virtues? I know I, them I have a, I have a briefly. ring with them on. But I, they, they, I feel like they overlap. I wonder what yes. you think of them. So it's courage, mm-hmm. temperance or self-discipline, justice, and wisdom. Mm-hmm. You like those? Yeah. Yeah, I like those. Is it, we're not open. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I love that. It's the, it's the best rock. Oh, my God. Imagine, imagine so ima- he had to go through two yeah. sets of doors. It's so good. Not a single his, positive yeah. sign that you're heading in the right direction or that you're allowed. Commitment, though. He's just going. <laughs> just going. You just keep going. You know, is that courage or is that stupidity? I don't know. Uh, well, I like to, uh, th- I, I've found that I'm so far out of society that it's easy for me to wander around and have no idea what's going on. And I quite enjoy it because there's a, there's a real... Um, honesty to it. Yes. Because if I'm not supposed to be somewhere, I don't really know I'm not supposed to be there. <laughs> and I just go there and I hang out until someone says, excuse me, sir, you're, you're just not supposed to be here. And then I go, oh my God, I am so sorry because I assumed I should be here. It's nice. That's one of the things you also learn when you're trying to come up and you want to get access or learn things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pretending uh, that you are supposed to be there mm-hmm. or pretending that you don't know you're not supposed yeah. to be there is a magical door opener. It's amazing. It's also, though, a way to get yourself in some serious trouble. <laughs> Dude, Tex is just sticking yes, her head I, <laughs> deep into someone else's problem. I had my probably funnest, I have no idea what's going on, and I'll just wander into this room yeah. at the uh, EA Sports uh, kickoff event for our video game. Yeah. And we had just done the Home Run Derby. So I'm standing there at the after party doing nothing. And all of a sudden I see this green room. I'm like, that's the green room. That's where the stars hang out. Yeah. And so I'm hanging out. And then these kind of girls come up and they're like, oh man, we are little Wayne's coming. We want to hang out with Lil Wayne. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah. I'm just standing here. Yeah. Like, well, if you see Lil Wayne, let us know. And I'm like, yeah. So they wander off. And then he comes. Here comes Lil Wayne, goes okay. in the room, and I go, ah, well, I'm a VIP. So I wander yeah. in right behind yeah. him. I'm sitting next to Lil Wayne and he's smoking and drinking and crunking. And he's like, ah, I gotta get some bitches up in here. And he's like, go doing Lil Wayne thing. I sure. said, excuse me, Wayne. I say, uh, you want me to get some chicks for you? Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, well, who's yeah. And I tell him who I am. He's like, oh, man, yeah, bro, yeah. So I go back out, find those girls. <laughs> I say, hey, girls. <laughs> They're like, what? I go, yeah, come on. I go, hang on, Lil Wayne. And then, yeah. so I brought these four girls. And he's like, oh, man, you my man. So partying with Lil Wayne in the room that I had there no idea go. existed, that I just wandered into. And then he pops up at one point and he goes, oh, hey, man, I got a set right now. Uh, I got to go. And he runs out. He's on stage. I watched him for like five minutes. I got the cab and I went. I was like. Yeah. There you go. There you go. I went in the room. Yeah. All right. So back to the <laughs> virtues. All right. So so uh, discipline, obvious one yeah. in fighting, right? Um, if you're not doing the work, I if you're not strict things. with yourself. Yeah, of course. No. 
Um, wisdom, of course. Mm-hmm. You said this is the most important weapon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, courage. Mm-hmm. I think I, I thought it was interesting. You said uh, you were always afraid in your fights. Mm-hmm. I, maybe people think courage and fear are opposites, but actually, hmm. without fear. There's no courage. Like no. if it's not a scary situation, you're just, yeah, you're just dumb. <laughs> you just wandered in where you thought you were supposed to be there, yeah. right? That that doesn't require any. No. Uh, that doesn't require. You have to be scared and then do it anyway. Yeah, that is the real. definition courage. of courage. Yeah, yeah. And then, ironically, the the way to get rid of the fear is to do the thing so many times that you get comfortable with it. Like people aren't you afraid like talking in front of people? I mean, not anymore. No, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's still always the edge because you yeah. know it can go bad. Like yeah. if you respect it, yeah, and you hold yourself to a a standard that is not easily met, it's always a little intimidating because you know it's a reach to get there. But you're you're not so scared of the worst case scenario anymore because yeah. you're like, I bombed. I know. I know you survive. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I so enjoy this coaching and other lifestyle. Because back in the day, you bomb, yeah. you get your ass kicked. Oh, yeah. so, it's so yes, yes, fun. Yes, yes. Then your You're coach like, is like, "What's wrong with you?" For you, it's like no one is currently punching me in the face. So this good. is pretty good. So good. It's greatest life ever. Yeah, just yes. travel around, enjoy it. You know, help people. <laughs> it's so good. I and then I think the problem with justice when people hear the word justice, they mm. immediately think social justice, which is obviously important. They think the justice system, which is important. But I also think, and I think this is a big part of martial arts culture, I'd be curious to hear what you think, you know, ethics, how uh, honesty, how, how the personal code of conduct that you choose to follow, mm-hmm. not the one that is enforced, not the one that the law says, but, you know, do you keep your word? Uh, do you give people a shot? You know, do you kick people when they're down? You know, like what, what, mm-hmm. are, what are the rules that you set for yourself that you follow? To me, that's, that's that virtue of justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a, a circular diagram, which is the circle of life inside mm-hmm. this Warriors Code program that I created. And it's a schematic for doing all of this. Okay. But at the center, there's a big circle yeah. called the secret life. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where all that stuff resides. And uh, the goal is to get rid of that secret life so it doesn't exist. Get all that stuff out because then you don't have to act that way, feel that way, treat people that way, have that energy. Yeah. Um, but there goes to courage and fear and, you know, we got to shrink down that that secret life. I carried around this, you know, no one ever knew I was in prison. I was a fighter, you know, da-da-da-da. And all of a sudden they're like, what? He was in prison? I said, I never told anybody for a decade. Yeah. Because I'm, I was trying to be someone else. Like that was my job was to grow this sport and be yeah. champion and da, 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 da. And that stuff didn't bode well in moving a new sport into, you know, regulation and, and getting back on television. What do you think of the expression? You're only as sick as your secrets. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. It's the, it's the greatest. And yeah. it's true. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I have lovely friends that I just love and they do bad things. <laughs> and I go, man, what are you doing? Yeah. And then, but they have, you know, it comes back. Yeah. You know, they don't feel good. They have health issues. They have relationship. It, it all comes back. And then I go, yo, man, maybe maybe not next time. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's working. It doesn't seem like it's worth it either. Yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah. But people are funny. The human experience as I get older, it's just fascinating. You know, it's fascinating what, how we think, what we do with our minds, what we do with our bodies. Like it's, it's just fascinating to me. Yeah, Cato, one of the Stoics, he said something like, if you do something hard for good, right, the work disappears, but the good remains. Yep. He says, but if you do something bad, the pleasure disappears, but the shame lingers. Mm-hmm. And I think that's pretty simple. And people go, yeah, of course. But then you look at their decisions or actions and they violate that a lot. Mm-hmm. Cheating, performance enhancers, mm-hmm. you know. Well, the ref didn't see it. Hey, it's not technically against the rules. Is that how you want to live your life? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's funny. Most people's secret life is, <laughs> is it? quite big. <laughs> yes, yes. It's not a little. <laughs> it's a little tiny It's dot. the main it's circle. Just, <laughs> I'm like, whoa. <laughs> What's going on there, buddy? But yeah, that it, it it took me a long time to get 
where I am today. I yeah. get comfortable. Sure. You know, I, I was in prison. I grew up in the streets. I had all these horrible things happen to me. And then I was always just fighting to survive, fighting to not die, <laughs> yeah. fighting to just get through my job. Make a living. Like just yeah. all these things. And so once I was able to, you know, reach a level where I didn't have those feelings, um, I was still all messed up. Like yeah. I still had all the pain and the, just all these traumas in my body, physical, emotional, spiritual. Um, you know, in the last, you know, 15 years, I've just been trying to fix that. Like you understand it, fix it, learn more, you know, figure out why I feel this way. Um, and I finally feel peaceful. Like I feel at peace. I walk down the road and I go, two things. I feel good and I can kill every human being on this street in a matter of seconds. <laughs> that's confidence. I go, hmm, I think I'll have a nice meal. <laughs> that's, that's how my brain works. What does honor mean as part of that culture? Because I think for some yeah. people, some people that word immediately makes sense. And then other people, it's loaded or controversial or it seems patriarchal or something. You know what I mean? Like yeah. what, is, what is honor? Well, if... If my plus gives me knowledge, I will honor that. Mm. I will honor him and I will respect that knowledge and I will give it to somebody with great value because mm. to me, he, he, him giving that to me is invaluable. Yeah. Yeah. Why would he do that? Why would, why would a human go, oh, here, like, take all my knowledge and go yeah. be successful? Yeah. Who does that? <laughs> right. So that exchange is very powerful. And yeah. for me, I'm, I'm honoring that person. Like what? Mow your lawn? Absolutely. Like, wash your car? Of course. Whatever yeah. you need. You know, drive your kids to school? I'd love to because I know what it will do for me. And, and therefore, I honor that. Yeah. Um, when I use, when I speak, when I, you know, use my words, I use them with honor. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm, these are the facts. You ask me a question? Huh. Question? Answer. I'm going to give right. you a factual, loving, kind, data-driven answer because I'm assuming you're looking for data. Yeah. And if not, then I'm going to try to figure out what you're really asking me and where it's coming from. And then I'll reply with that. But that's what honor does for me. When I, I won't teach somebody my martial art if I know they will use it incorrectly. Hmm. Because that would be dishonorable. Yeah. I have they so, would dishonor. They it. would dishonor. Because they won't understand the value. Yeah. So they would go, oh, look at this. Like, oh, let me break your arm. Yeah. Because they wouldn't have learned the value. But me as a teacher would have taught that value or I would have get, never given the knowledge. Sure. So there's just this, that's where honor is for me. I won't lie to my student. My student won't lie to me. Yeah. Mr. Shamrock, I can't afford these classes. Okay, let's sure. talk about that. Yeah. Like, let's not make up excuses because yeah. that's honor, sir. I love what I'm doing, but this is it. Oh, great. Let's deal with that. Right. That's honor. Directness, communication, trust. Um, that's what that means to me. I love that. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, being a pro, being a man, uh, being a leader, you know, being a captain. We kind of have these, these expressions. Some mm -hmm. of them are gendered, some of them are specific to specific domains or sports, but it's this idea of like, look, if you're gonna assume this role, there's responsibilities and obligations that come along with that. And you have to take that seriously. And if you're not, then you're not worthy of that thing. Yeah, I know honoring that. I think about that. I have a little note by the side of my desk because it, it's 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 weird for me. Like I didn't make any of this stoicism stuff up, right? Mm -hmm. This is an ancient tradition that I, because of my books and then because of social media, I'm in a position where I'm identified with it, mm -hmm. right? And I've had the honor and privilege of being able to talk about it with millions of people. But I could just think, hey, this is a great, a great hustle I came up with this is a great, this is great. Look how lucky I am or look how special I am. I actually have a little note by the side of my desk that says, are you being a good steward of stoicism? So as I make decisions, how much is this going to cost versus this? You know, do I, do I want to do this kind of thing, even though it might, some people might like it and some people might hate it. Um, do I want to take this stand? Do I want to speak out about this or that? I, I, I have to think about not just what I want to do, not just what's good for me, but am I am I honoring, as you said, this thing that is not yours? You possess only temporarily, um, and uh, are you doing? Are you doing? Are you being a good steward? Are you treating it honorably? That's a that's a really important thing. I think people have to to 
to come to terms with. Because I think people think, you know, hey, it's not illegal. Hey, there's no gun to my head. So I'm just going to do whatever I want. And I think the upside of the freedom of American life is that you can pretty much do what you want and live how you want. But the the obligation is, uh, or the expectation is like, you have to decide there's certain things that you could do that you're not going to do. Do you know who Viktor Frankl is? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He said that the there should be, you know, the Statue of Liberty. You come into America through uh, New York Harbor, or you fly over, you see the Statue of Liberty. That's one facet of what it means to be an American. You can do what you want. Mm-hmm. But he said there should be a statue of responsibility on mm. the West Coast, <laughs> right? And to <sighs> me, good. honor is the is the middle yeah. between liberty and responsibility. You can, but should you? Yeah. Will yeah. you? That's that secret life. What do you do when, yes. when nobody's looking? Yes. And that tells a lot about who you are and, and truly what you are. Yeah. You know, because you are what you, what you do. You are what you think. It, it is what it is. <laughs> if you do bad things <laughs> when no one's looking, then technically you kind of do bad things when no one's looking. Well, and is that, we were talking about being number one in the world, which you were, you were the best fighter pound for pound, mm-hmm. like in, on the planet. But there's something interesting. It's like, you can see that two ways. Like you're like, I am that, or that is a spot that exists that a person gets to temporarily possess mm-hmm. for a certain time, right? Like, yes, you're a champion forever. Yes, you get to say you were number one forever, but it's in the past tense. No one gets mm-hmm. to keep it forever. So how did you treat the thing that you knew someone else was going to get after you, right? Did you honor yeah. the position or not? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. You know, um, I'm not asking you because I, I think you did. Yeah, but. yeah, I did. Um, and I didn't consciously do it. I just knew that I would learn more and deeper if I kept giving it away and like, you know, protecting it. Yeah. So, you know, the reason I had such growth is I started teaching and I started using all these mechanics. And so I was at the cutting edge of, of literally technical development. Like, yeah. Hey guys, bring your body. Let's try this. Yeah. Hey, what about this? And twist my arm and do this. And so we were able to stay in front of all this development and, and knowledge. Yeah. And that was the secret sauce. And then I under, I believed, I, I understood its value, especially when I started getting the results I did. Yeah. So I 100% honored that. And, you know, like, I, I mean, you know, when they bought, when the, Fertitas bought the UFC. I was hired to go, you know, train them and, you know, teach them about martial arts because they were outside the culture. I went, taught them, and they didn't know what martial arts was. Yeah. And so they had an entirely different culture and it didn't mesh. And I was like, oh, that's not, that's not how I, that's not why I want to hang out. That's a different, you know, flavor of what's not martial arts. They didn't, uh, they didn't have any conception of what it took to do this and what it took for these people to survive and live and thrive and work together and get knowledge. And so they didn't know and didn't care. And I was like, I don't want to be involved in that. That's yeah. not my, that goes against everything that I stand for. Everything. Wasn't that what's happening in golf right now? It's yeah, like, it's you so know, like you're, uh, <laughs> it's if so you're true. one of the best golfers yeah. in the world, should yeah. you leave the league that's existed for a hundred years that has all the best players in the best format and go basically play exhibition golf, mm-hmm. be part of the golf Harlem Globetrotters slash green wa- or uh, sports washing for the yeah. Saudis, even though you'll get paid lots of money, or should you stick with the sport? And I think, I think if, yeah. if, if you are, your honor dictate, honor dictates what that, I wouldn't say, I would say honor makes that choice easy. It's not an easy choice. Mm-hmm. None of us have had to, to go, do I want a hundred million dollars or not? But I think we should give a lot of respect to mm-hmm. the people who said, no, the sport, competition, mm-hmm. the purity of it, you know, that's more important to me than sometimes more than $100 million. Yeah. That's what was most important to me. Yeah. And that's where I got so, you know, th- that's why I was able to keep getting successful, you know, successes in different areas. Because mm-hmm. I believed I was 100%. Like, the, the changes it made in my life and the things it did for me were extraordinary. And yeah. Uh, so I honored that. I valued that. I really believed in it. And yeah, still do. We were talking about Floyd Patterson earlier. The, the, that boxing writer, I forget who it was, said, um, you know, he's a credit to his race, the human race, you know? And yeah. w- at a time when, yeah. when um, sure. people, 
we're making real racial distinctions, right? And it's like, I think that's a good question. Are you, are you a credit to your profession? Are you a credit to where you come from? Are you a credit to, to your industry? You know, are you a credit to your neighborhood? Whatever it is, like, are you, are you leaving it better than you found it? Are you mm -hmm. treating it with respect? Are you doing it honorably? Or are you maximizing your gains, mm -hmm. you know, maximizing your fans or fame or whatever? And uh, that can be a hard choice. Sometimes it's an easy choice, but um, it's, uh, it's the choice that matters. It's the only choice that matters. Yeah. <laughs> I've been rich, famous, not famous, <laughs> poor, lived on the streets, <laughs> top, bottom, you name it. Yeah. And that's the only thing that matters. And I do all, I, I don't, I don't market what I do. You can't find what I do anywhere. Interesting. But everybody finds me. Yeah. And everybody knows what happens when you hire me. That's yeah. just how it works. Because <laughs> they go, oh, Frank Shamrock. And they tell the story and what happened and what it did for them. And they go, oh, man, call this guy. So it's right. just that. The Which is ultimately much better marketing totally. than anything yeah. else. Yeah, because I only get people that are really on it and that really sure. want change and that are really looking to do something different and impact the world that didn't have the same, you know, ethos yeah and i want those people because those are the people that will 10x 20 like that will crush it in the universe yeah um yeah and they find me so you know it works out i'm gonna tell you a little story maybe you can relate to it so mark surrealist loses his father as a young man um loses his grandfather and basically is sort of raised an orphan and um the emperor hadrian sees something in him but he sees that he's too young. Hadrian doesn't have an heir, but he sees that Marcus is too young. And obviously you don't wanna give someone too much power and access too early. So he sets up uh, a guy named Antoninus Pius, who's he's a powerful politician, but kind of a regular guy. And he, we're told that he, he selects Antoninus Pius because he sees when Antoninus doesn't know anyone's looking, he sees Antoninus helping his father-in-law, mm. his elderly father-in-law up mm -hmm. a flight of stairs, just like a, a gesture of kindness when no one is looking. So Hadrian adopts Antoninus on the condition that he in turn adopts Marcus Aurelius. Mm -hmm. And the thinking was that Marcus would, or that, that Antoninus would rule for a couple years, right? Because what's life expectancy in ancient Rome yeah. around the turn of the century? Instead, Antoninus rules for almost 20 years. Oh. And so Marcus, you know, could see this one of two ways. He could see this as this old old man is between me and my birthright, or not birthright, but the, you know, what I was selected for. Or this is the ultimate plus minus equal situation, <laughs> right. right? And um yeah. he trains under Antoninus for the next 20 years. And if you've ever, if anyone's ever read Marx Realist's Meditations, the first part of the book is all about his debts and gratitudes. And there's no one that he thanks more than Antoninus. Mm -hmm. All the things that he learned from him. You know, they, sh they could have been rivals. They could have fought it out. All he, you know, he learns how to listen to experts, he says. Mm -hmm. He learns how to be disciplined. He learns how to, how to accept the gifts of fortune, but not need them like we're talking about. You know, um, how to not put on airs. Uh, how to learn, um, all the things he learns from him. And then so when Marcus, you know, does eventually become emperor, he's ready, right? And then um, maybe this maybe this fits in with the uh, the minus or the equal. Do you know what Marcus does? The first thing he, he does with absolute power? Mm -mm. Well, he has a stepbrother, right? And he anoints his stepbrother co-emperor. The first thing he does with absolute power, the thing that's supposed to corrupt absolutely yeah. every other king in history, yeah. you know, he, he names mm. his brother co-emperor and he, he writes in meditations, not just of his gratitude for Antoninus, but his gratitude for his brother, who a lot of people didn't really like. And he says, I'm grateful that I had the stepbrother that I did, whose character so dramatically improved my own. Mm. <laughs> nice. That's not a perfect analog yeah. to your story, but I feel <laughs> yeah. like there's some uh, some broad stroke similarities. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's been, well, you know my story, just random strangers all throughout my life have helped me out. Like yeah. just, hey man, you, you, you're a little messed up there. Let me, let me give you some thoughts, some advice and some help. And um, it, it's been the greatest 50 years ever. 
And honestly, uh, I don't talk about this much, but uh, in the early days of fighting, I knew, you know, I had to get out. It's too dangerous. Sport wasn't growing. It was actually shrinking. And so, you know, when I I started my family and got everything going, I was looking at this thing and I was like, yeah, I'll probably die on this journey because this is super hardcore. And I could tell people didn't really know what was going on and it was unregulated. And and so I took that step, you know, I was like, all right, well, I'll commit to it. You know, I'll, I'm all in. Someone yeah. wants to kill me and that'll well, be, you know, if they do, God bless them, they'll win. And then, you know, problem solved. And like my, a gladiator. And then my exit plan was I had a million dollars worth of life insurance. And mm-hmm. so I went in with this mindset every time, let's do this. And what I quickly realized is nobody else had the mindset or that backup. And yeah. so no one else was willing to go down that path yeah. with me. Um, and it just, what that did to my mindset to A, have a backup plan. Because, yeah. hey, if I die, who's going to take care of my family? Sure, sure. It's cared for. And then to have a real plan for what was happening, happening. You know, that's where, to me, if you got your plans in place and you got an exit strategy, you can pretty much do anything. I was curious because you, I mean, you had a rough childhood, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. But there were also moments of grace and generosity mm-hmm. and yeah. and people stepping up in that childhood. Uh, how has that shaped your life and your story? Well, it's, it's made everything. I mean, I I left home when I was 11. You know, I just lost my family and everything associated with it. And um, so I didn't have any skills. I Every experience and you know, thing I'd ever experienced was in a book. Yeah. Like I just read books. I was a nerd. I was traumatized. I didn't interact well with people. Yeah. I couldn't figure it out. And so I would just read. And then, um, you know, once I got out of that world, everything was just new. Everything was new. And and it didn't, you know, I, I would commit crimes, but I didn't hurt anybody, you know, and it's, it would, I would just move me around. I'd keep meeting people. Yeah. But nine out of 10 of those people would stop and go, well, what's going on with you? And I'd be like, oh, I'm messed up. I got all these issues. And they'd let me help you. And so as I got less and less messed up and I got more and more in control of myself, it's just more and more values came from those people. But all of them, random strangers, prison guards who were like, hey, man, you know, you're smart. You're, you know, what are you doing here? Like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm an idiot. And you're like, well, let me help you and give me knowledge. Only because I'm asking dumb questions and sure. I'm like, I don't really want to be here. I don't. I don't feel like I fit in. <laughs> but yeah, the kindness of people. That's why I do what I do now in helping people and traveling around and, sh- you know, just communicating truthfully with people because at its core, people are good. Yeah. At its core, people are kind. It, it, every, every human interaction that I've had has been good when there's kindness and love and people aren't afraid and nervous or intimidated sure. or ego or a bunch of crap, <laughs> there's always, hey, like it's a genuine human connection of love. Sure. And, and that inspires me. Like that is what keeps me going because that's my spirit. As people give, people give me that and I go, ah, yes, this feels good. <laughs> what did you learn from your parents and your adopted parents about being a parent, being a leader, what to do, what not to do? I learned a lot from Bob Shamrock. In, in, That's where your last name comes from. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The, the man who adopted me. Um, you know, I was in, a group, in his group home when I was 13 until I was 16. Um, and then when I went to prison, he, he adopted me. But yeah, he, you know, he was, he was good with boys. Yeah. And he didn't teach me anything about girls. <laughs> he taught me about boys, how to lead boys, you know. And then he was a great leader with great morals mm. and ethics. So yeah. he didn't curse, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't, none of that stuff. He was deep, deeply religious. And so he just stood by some very important things. And that was it. This is how you become a Honor. young man. This is what you do. Yeah, this is what you do. And then this is the result. And it was simple. One, two, three, result. Sure. And so it's the first time I've ever had someone explain that to me and give me guidance. And, and model it. And model it. And then do it. Yeah, everybody yeah. else was doing weird stuff and telling a lot. You know, it, was, it wasn't truthful representation of mm. what I was being told to do. Yeah. So this was the first person who showed me that. And, and it was just, it made all the difference in the world. I was a lost kid. I was struggling, really struggling. I mean. It sounds like he never gave up on you. He never did. Mm-mm. Even I went to prison. I mean, I went to prison for three and a half years. And he adopted he, you at, during or after? Yeah. When I got out, he adopted me. Yeah. He, he never left my side. And, you know, just. What do you think that was? Love. He, you know, he wanted to have a son and he, he couldn't. And then, you know, when him and his wife separated, you know, they're 
previous agreement was we'll keep these kids, we'll help them, but you know, we're not going to keep them, keep them. Yeah. Know, we're just going to help them and we're going to send them on their way and that'll be our service. And that's what we do. It's a good thing. Yeah. And then after his wife left, it, you know, I think it took, it put a big hole in his heart. And so, but he had these two boys, Ken and I, and, and they, you know, they were the, he, we were the boys he always wanted <laughs> that you know, he never got to keep. And yeah. And he was in, you know, we had genetic, we had all the stuff that he wanted and looked for and, um, and yeah, he, you know, he showed me love and it was, no man has ever done that for me. You know, no man has ever, you know, just been real kind to me and, you know, just really touched my heart. You know, I really fell in love with him. He was, he was a great man. And you feel like that that's got to be part of the, the paying it forward for you. Oh, what totally. What drives it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I know what it did for me. And I was just a dumb kid running around yeah. like, and he went, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> no, no, no. And I tried to tell him some dumb story and yeah. probably steal something. He's like, no, stop. Uh -uh. This is how you become a man. And I was like, oh my God, this is what I'm looking for. Like, this is what you need. That's what you get when you go to martial arts. <laughs> like, all right, stand up, uh, 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 sir. Yeah. Then you go, oh yeah, yeah. That's how I present and that's how I move. And that's what I'm supposed to do. And uh, I, don't know. I didn't know any of that stuff. I grew up on the streets You know, my mom didn't teach me a whole lot. She was traumatized. She, she was abused, you know, in all different ways. And, and she was just really shut down emotionally um, and in, in her ability to share love. That to me, that's such a fundamental part of Christianity that people gloss over, but like um, this idea, like, if you've been blessed, be a blessing. Like you've been given a free gift, you must give freely. Pass it on, or it's going to disappear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've noticed if you don't, you don't give, then eventually it'll be taken from you. Did he believe in you as a fighter? Oh no. Hmm. Yeah, no. But I think that was love. You know, he saw me because I was really emotional. I was traumatized. Mm -hmm. I mean, my aunt found me hanging upside down and in the hallway closet when I was two years old, in the back of my knees, just crying in a closet alone, hanging, you know, so I can only imagine the things that happened to me when I was a child. Sure. And so I could just never get control of my emotions and stuff. And I was always afraid and fearful. And, um, you know, Bob just, you know, he saw that. He saw that. He saw I was traumatized. He saw yeah. I was scared. He saw, and he had experience. He'd yeah. done it before. Yeah. And so he's like, oh, yeah. Here. Hey, man, eh, eh, eh. line him up. Get yeah, over yeah. there. Get, get, sir, yes, he sir. Get going. He had confidence that he yeah, could he fix knew. you. Yeah. He knew what he was doing. He's like, get in line. And so yeah. I did. And best thing, best thing that's ever happened. But did he, do you think you were drawing on that love and that support when you went to go do a crazy odds against you thing? Or? Um, well, so, yeah. So back to the. Um, I knew Bob loved me mm. and then I just didn't have the emotional capacity and stability at the time to love him the way he loved me. Mm. I have it now, but now he's dead and I've missed the moment, mm. but, um, I just didn't have it. I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. reciprocate. Yeah. I reciprocated and being what he wanted me to be and, sure. you know, doing whatever I could do to, that I knew made him happy and, yeah. you know, fill my role as a son. Um, but when it came to fighting, he saw me as that hurt little traumatized boy Yeah, and I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so that was our first, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, you can't do this. I'm like, what, who, yeah. what are you talking about? And it yeah. was hard for me to stomach because he was the one who believed in me yeah. since the very beginning. And now he was coming to me. It was when I was fighting Tito. Yeah. And he literally came and said, he's too big for you. He's going to beat you up. And I go, what? I'm the greatest fighter on the planet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But to have my dad tell me that was like, it was hard, really. That is hard. That was tough, you know? I think it's, it's hard for parents because above all, you want your kids to survive, yeah. right? You want them to yeah, live. Love. But you want, you know what I mean? You want them, you'd like them to be happy, but you definitely don't want them to be dead yeah. or maimed, <laughs> you know? And so there's a tension, right? Yeah. Like they want to be the greatest ever at X, Y, or Z. And you, you you want them to do what they want. You don't want them to get hurt more than anything, though. And so you, I think it is something that kids have to realize is that your parents' unconditional, undying, ceaseless love for you sometimes doesn't make them the best at giving you career advice, yeah. <laughs> right? Do you, need a, you need a different plus. Yes. Someone who's done the thing that you're mm -hmm. trying to do that cares about you, but, but also cares about the thing, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, like when I dropped out of college to be a writer, 
My parents thought I was blowing up my entire life. Mm -hmm. Other writers that I knew were like, you can definitely do this. It's all right. You can always go back to school. And you need that, you need that mm -hmm. tension, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe as a parent, you have to understand your fundamental bias and go, yeah. hey, can't get don't ask me it. on this one. You know, no. I'll support you whatever you do. But if you ask me if I think you should go in the <laughs> octagon and get the shit beat out of you, I'm going to say no. <laughs> Not a good idea. It's also why I don't want you to join the Marines. Yeah. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's there's a ten, there's a tension there. Yeah, there's a tension. Um, four martial arts classes and your son. Yeah, let him do his thing. Totally different martial arts class. Go do, totally let different. him go yeah. outside, talk yes. on the phone. Let him have his world. Yes, because the ones that don't, it's it's it really impedes the children's ability to grow. Yes. Because they're connected over here and they, they're, they're, they're more connected here than here. Yes. And I so want him to tether, whole thing. Yeah. tether to some yeah. Yeah. Uh, one else in a different kind of energy yeah. and mastery that I don't have. Yeah. You know, um, if it was a writing class, we'd have a different relationship to yeah. it or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I, I actually want, and I actually think he needs somebody else bossing him around. Oh, you yeah, know? yeah, 100%. Yeah, no, it's so good for yeah. especially boys. Yes. Because we don't get that data. Like, we don't get, no one tells you how to become a man. Yes. Like, nobody's like, all right, here, this is, a, it's so confusing. Well, they Until, tell you a bunch of shit that they, that, yeah, they that think is about being a man that has yeah. nothing to do with being a man. Yeah. yeah. Then, then they regret it years yeah. later because, yeah. oh, I was wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I gave you I all I wasn't the... <laughs> in touch with my own emotions either. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I told I you, you bad crying advice. made you a little bitch, oh, you know, or whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, my God. It's... Okay. I, got... I have to tell you my Tom Brady story. Okay. Let me hear it. You haven't heard this one. No. And so, um, you don't... this is what you don't know about me. Okay. I don't watch sports. Okay. I don't watch television. Okay. I don't really participate much in society. Except for I hang You're out with my friends. Monk. I hang out with people I love. Yeah. And with those people, I work and I do interact. I do all this crazy stuff with yeah. business. Like we, you know, I'm deeply sure. involved with, with, with people that I love. And so after your book came out, I was standing at LAX airport and I was waiting across the street with my driver. This big, tall white guy shows up next to me and he's got a driver too. And he looks to me and he says, oh, uh, Mr. Shamrock. I go, oh, oh, hey. He goes, hey, uh, read, uh, read your uh article chapter in uh, Ryan's book. And uh, I wanted to uh, say it was great. Like really, I think it was the ego one. He's really, really powerful stuff. And, uh, you know, it really touched me and da, 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 da. And I go, oh, wow, man, thank you. Like, you know, hey, I, I really appreciate that. So then we have this human moment and uh, I can see he's my equal yeah. in some way because yeah. we're both here, the drivers and we're both in the thing. and Both goats. Right. And so we're doing our thing. And then I say, uh, I, hey, um, oh, what do you do, man? I, you know, yeah. hey, this is really cool. Well, what do you do? I play football. I go, oh, right on, man. I go, well, how's it coming? He goes, you know, it's good. I make some adjustments. Da, 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 da. So he kind of, you know, he's just downplaying it. And I go, right on, man. I go, what's your name again? He said, I'm Tom, Tom Brady. I go, right on, Tom. I go, it's really nice to meet you, brother. And he's like, yeah, man, I'll see you around. So he goes this way. I go that way. I get in my car, call my wife. I says, hey, uh, do you know a guy named Tom Brady? She's like, bro, you're like... She's like, what do you do with your life? He's like, you're like the biggest star in football right now. I go, oh, I just met him at the airport. And she goes, no, no, no. He's married to Giselle. That was her vision. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah. He's married to Giselle. I right, go, right, right. who's Giselle? She knows his more famous <laughs> wife. Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's fucking a glimpse amazing. into my mindset because for me, I only focus on the things that are really important around me, the people I sure. love, the people that I can impact. And then anyone else just sort of wanders into my universe. Yeah. And then if they stay... We hang out and do stuff. If they don't, they usually leave with some knowledge or some change or some thinking, and then they wander off and they do other good things. Yeah, like Amanda. You know, she went and she's helped now thousands of people deal with this incredibly complicated, powerful, horrible subject. Yeah, and she's doing it through art, and it's healing her. I just met her on a plane. I probably had a couple yeah. of drinks and didn't sleep well, anyways. But I thought, ah, this has great energy, and maybe we can help each other. You know what I love about that story? It's a it's a, a nice bit of proof of the expression game recognizes game. Yeah, yeah. You didn't know who he was, but you recognized that he was someone. Yeah. You know, you this wasn't an insurance salesman <laughs> yeah. or something, right? Like you knew this was a this was a dude even though you didn't know anything about it. And I I have been fascinated in the way that special forces operators and quarterbacks mm, and yeah. you know, uh founders even though they exist in totally different worlds and can do totally different things, there's some level where once you've gotten, 
once you've achieved maybe not even a black belt, but an upper belt in what you do, you have both um, a sixth sense for other people in their different worlds, and you have an openness to learning from them, mm -hmm. maybe even more than your other equals, right? Like, it's like, do you spend all your time with other fighters or what are your equal signs in totally different domains? Those are the people that teach you the most that you have the deepest connection with because there's not even the hint of like zero sumness, right? Mm -hmm. Like your success in martial arts or business, it doesn't up or down Tom Brady in any way. You're both just on your pursuit of mastery and game recognizes game or hunger recognizes hunger or whatever. That, but that is a crazy story that I am very glad to hear. <laughs> yeah, do. that was all from you. Nuts. Nuts. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Super good. Dude, thank you so much. I'm so glad we did this in person. Yeah, me too. Awesome.